Last September, I gathered up my gear and headed north to check out Cyprus Island. There's a small blob of land connected to the main island with a spit, and there are sheltered coves both north and south of this spit. The wind was out of the north, so I planned on staying in the southern gunk hole. I put in late in the morning. The wind was 20 knots out of the north, the tide was outgoing. When I left the breakwater, I was beating into tide-stacked wind waves that were so rough I couldn't even let go of the boat to hit record on the camera. Once I made it to a place in the lee of Whidbey Island, though, the seas flattened out so I could begin documenting this trip. Okay, well, I got out of that mess. There's like five, six foot uh, breakers uh, all the way up to um, past uh, Edmonds. I'm uh, looking at Everett. I'm off the coast of Muckleteo right now. So um, it's kind of flattened back out now I, uh, yeah, now I can take it easy. That was a little bit of work, but here we go, onward and upward. I decided to duck back behind Hat Island, that lump directly ahead, in attempts to avoid breaking my eggs on the choppy water. To the left of Hat Island is the waterway I wanted. To the right of Hat Island is Port Susan, a waterway I most certainly did not want. After traveling some 10 miles or so up into Port Susan, I realized what I had done. So I turned around and backtracked, but the damage was done. I wasn't going to make it to the fuel dock in Laconic. The worst part about it? It's not the first time I've stared at my chart while making way and still made this stupid mistake. My Garmin assured me there was a marina with gas, so I made for it with all due haste. What I found was an unused boat ramp with a weather-beaten dock. So, after burning that much gas, I had to stop and pick the closest place that had gas. And that happens to, I looked for a marina. The app said that this was a marina, and now I'm at a dead end. I'm basically walking to the nearest gas station with a gas can boat's tied up getting the shit kicked out of it and uh yeah there you have it i am uh to carrying the gas can if you look back there you see the marina and somewhere about a thousand feet ahead of me is a gas station so there you have it well i'm warm and this gas can, this gas can is freaking heavy. Five gallons of gas is not heavy until you carry it for a quarter mile. By the time I got back underway and made it to LaConnor, the fuel dock was closed. I got a room with a hot tub at the LaConnor Channel Lodge, ate a burger, and then cried myself to sleep. In the morning, I filled up with gas and then got rolling again. I just popped myself in the nose with a bungee. That smarted just a little bit. I won't do that again. But I got, I was uh, putting those bungees right there on that bag and just got myself good. Just boink. A little bit of, a little bit of bleeding and stuff. So, oh well.
A lot of people really hate polyline. It doesn't take a knot and it feels bad in the hand. We used to use a lot on container ships and I got used to it. And one of the tricks I learned to keep a poly knot from disintegrating is called an oki. In three strand poly, you simply run the bitter end of the line under three consecutive strands in the standing part of the line and you're as secure as you can get. Poly is highly visible, resists UV, and floats, so for the ground tackle on small boats, I prefer it. For camping on a sea dew, you need just three things in addition to the usual gear you take when riding for fun. High quality dry bags, secure attachment points on the boat, and a portable cooler. My main sea dew has the cooler already figured into it as part of the trim package and it has so many ways to attach gear that there's often too many ways to secure my load. So that left me with just needing to get robust dry bags. When I pack, I put my gear into smaller dry bags. I then place these packed dry bags into a big dry duffel and so far I haven't been sorry. On this ride I spent time with each wave soaking rider and gear for hours on end and all my gear was dry when I unpacked and set up my camp. Well, currently I am monitoring uh, channel 68. There was a, a woman here in a rowboat. And when I came across that area right over there, uh, right at that point of land, there was, well, I was airborne. <laughs> I was hauling ass, but I was airborne. So she's in a little tiny, maybe nine foot, eight foot uh, rowboat. And I'm at, uh, monitoring channel 68 uh, in case I need to do a fast rescue. As I like to do, I have found myself a good windy spot. However, I have made myself a windbreak. The difference is kind of phenomenal, actually. Let me step up behind it. There be wind. The jet ski has a stern tie going. Um, so far, so good. We're going to see how that system works. Uh, it is my stern tie in a bucket. So basically, all the line gets coiled up, bucket and everything. Uh, sorry, um, anchor and everything goes in the bucket. And that stern tie enables me to uh, pull the stern out into the water. I throw the anchor out, I pull it, pull this line, and uh, the line on this side. And um, it pulls the boat back towards the anchor. This was the one knot of wind they promised. So, there you go, one knot of wind. And, as you can see, Camp wind block has grown a little bit. Um, wanted to shelter the tent from the full brunt of the wind. So I did the uh, added wall there just to kind of knock that wind down a little bit. Now, maybe I can eat. What does it look like when you've been beating into the wind? Inside of your cooler? This was my skirt take. That of my avocados. This is what we call a freaking mess. Yeah, there's things to just don't want to do. What's for dinner for us? Well, everything that got the ever living crap beat out of it on the way here. And the pounding waves, everything opened. So I'm cutting up pieces of meat. I'm putting them in here. I'm stirring this up. Like so, thusly. And then what are you doing for it? Well, then, I'm grabbing my knife, this knife I got in Salala Oman. It is made in Pakistan. This knife has been in some places. Uh, then I am fishing out said pieces of meat, cutting them up and eating them. Like a goddamn barbarian. You see, as a man of action, there are certain things that get lost in the many different details of being a man of action. Some of those things include things like soap, 
other things, frying pans, knives, oh no, I got knives, sorry, forks, I got no forks, um, so basically I'm down to, well, these are worthless, they won't fit in there, these will not fit in there, I tried putting one on top, it didn't work, but as a man of action, who needs that? Fry up your meat, fish it out, cut it into pieces needed. I'm pretty, I'm pretty convinced that that is probably the best way possible to eat a piece of meat. Who needs guacamole when you can eat smashed avocado? It's not stirred, it's pounded into jello under its own weight. The dinner of champions. On this particular trip, due to my detour up into Port Susan and luxuriating in a hot tub in La Conner, I only had a brief opportunity to hike up to the top of the island's south end. I barely scratched the surface of the island's vast trail system, ate some distinctly tortilla-free and unforked foodstuffs, then bedded down for the night. By sunup, I had torn down my tent and packed it all up, leaving it cleaner than I found it. everything these things are flogging to beat hell and driving me nuts just the sound of them is awful freaking awful who could take that not me i can't take it i think i can do to not hear that flog 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 what'd you say you said flog What else is flogging? You're flogging. You guys are flogging. I tell you what, spinning around like this will make you dizzy. Holy crap. That's not a good thing to do. Okay. I feel like that's pretty damn secure. Okay.